Good morning, everyone. So my topic is the birth of the Austrian school. And um, it's very uncommon in the history of economic ideas or the history of ideas in general that you can identify exactly the time and, and, and the place and the person who has come up with, uh, with, with a particular idea or has developed a school of thought. But we can do that with Austrian economics. Um, as we'll see in a moment, there is one, uh, there is a, some confusion about, about Austrian economics, and we'll, we'll talk about the founder in a moment, uh, Karl Menger. Um, he tends to be mixed in with two other um, economists who came up with a very similar idea, and, uh, which is the, the law of marginal utility, which I, I'll, I'll explain a little bit later on. But the interpretation that Menger and the Austrians give to this law and how it affects value um, was very, very different than those of the other economists. So um, the Austrian school was founded during the marginalist revolution by Karl Menger, okay? Um, he wrote a book in 1871, you can see the name there. Um, at the same time, or very nearly the same time, two other economists, one British, one French, wrote books that came up with, the, that developed the principle of um, marginal utility. Um, there, there were different names given for that principle. Um, for example, it was called a marginal utility by Menger's student. Menger never really gave the principle a name. And um, final utility by Jevons, who was a British economist, and uh, Rarité by Valras, who was a French economist. Um, when you're going through history of thought, it's very interesting and, and, and fruitful to look at the pictures of the people. Um, so, we have uh, here um, William Stanley Jevons, a British economy that came, economist that came up with the, with, with, with the idea. Um, notice he looks like when he's young, he's a very dashing ladies' man. But then when he gets older, he's like a weird old guy feeding pigeons on a bench. I mean, I mean, I, um, and then we have Leon Volras, um, very handsome and dashing when he's younger. But then he looks like your grandfather as he gets older. Um, Menger, on the other hand, um, <laughs> is ha handsome and hip, right? And, and he gets older, he's very distinguished. This seems to carry over in, into the modern era on, of Austrian economists. Um, <laughs> but that being said, um, there, there was a big difference between the way the economists conceived of margin utility. Utility is just another word for, for satisfaction, just to anticipate what I'm gonna say. Um, Jevons and Morad saw utility as a quantity of, of something, a quantity of satisfaction that's given by a good um, that could be added, subtracted, and compared between people. Whereas Menger viewed utility as the um, result of an individual's judgment about how important various goods are to that person's welfare. So for, for Menger, his idea of utility was not a quantity, but a ranking. It was a ranking of different things. So if you had $2 um, uh, at, to spend, um, and, you, and, and you could spend it on only a few different, uh, and, and then that's all you had, um, you would rank the different things that, that you would uh, purchase. For example, um, you would rank a bottle of water higher than, than a can of Coke and higher than a, a granola bar. So mo the most, the highest utility would be from, from the um, bottle of water and, and the lowest from the granola bar. And there are other things that you could spend the $2 on. But the point is, it, it, it's a ranking. And it, it's based purely on someone's subjective judgment of how important to their welfare consuming a particular good is. So if, if $2 w w was what you would spend on any of these three alternatives and you only had the $2, the alternative that, ha that is highest in your ranking, we call it a value scale, would be th that, that yields you the highest margin utility. Okay, you can't say that, that the um, satisfaction you get from a can of Coke or, or from a bottle of water is three times that which you get from a can of Coke. Um, so that's the difference. The, it's a, very, a deep philosophical difference between sort of treating utility as, as, as something that could be added up and treating it as a judgment made by an individual person about what is more important, what is less important to them. So, but, he, but see, this is where things get confused. Menger didn't just discover marginal utility. 
um, he discovered much more that was a lot different from what Jevons and Valras went on to uh, develop as their economics. So Menger developed really the whole system of economics, and he showed that it was based on subjective value and individual choice, based on this principle of margin utility. Um, he was really a he was a creative genius. Before he before he wrote this view of the economy as being the implications of all these different people choosing what is most important to them, striving to satisfy their wants, that didn't exist, okay? There were people that were predecessors of, of Menger who talked about uh, that value was subjective, it was dependent on the individual's judgment, but they never put together a whole system of economics like he did. So um, most historians of thought recognize Menger's achievement, uh, not, not, not most, but most good uh, historians of thought recognize Menger's achievement. Um, and I'll just, I'll just read a quote from one. Um, Ludwig von Mises said, what is known as the Austrian School of Economics started in 1871 when Karl Menger published a slender volume under the title Principles of Economics. Until the end of the 70s, the 1870s, there was no Austrian school, there was only Karl Menger. So all the fundamental ideas of the Austrian school can be traced back to, to Karl Menger. Okay, that's a given. Um, before Menger wrote, there, uh, the dominant school of economics, though not the only one, but the dominant one, was the, the um, British classical school. And th those are three of the names, very prominent names associated with the British classical school, David Hume, Adam Smith, uh, and David Ricardo. Um, and they dominated economics for, for 100 years, from when Smith wrote his book in 1776 to 1871, when the marginalist revolution, which we talked about, took place. And this is, this is the end of the classical school marked the beginning of modern economics, okay? Jevons, Valras, Menger, all reacting against the classical school. But Menger didn't throw out the, the classical school completely. He thought that they, they did some good things. They had some contributions. Um, they pointed out that prices are not random. When you see a price, it's not accidental. It's not an accident of history that the price just happens to be this. And it's also not arbitrary. The seller can't just set the price. In fact, the price is determined. They, they recognize this, at least in the short run, by supply and demand, which they consider to be immutable laws of reality, okay? So Menger liked the fact that they attributed price to a, a term, determination of supply and demand, and that they saw these laws determining price as immutable and universal, true in every country and at every time. Um, that was a good thing that the classical school did. Um, also, the classical school had a theory of calculation. They said these prices were used by businessmen or entrepreneurs to calculate profits and losses, and these profits and losses then allowed them to decide wh what to produce, where to produce, what technology to use. So calculation based on market prices directed where resources would be um, uh, invested. Uh, and, and, and so this was good. Um, but there was a flaw, okay? And it was a big flaw in classical economics. So the classical school attempted to, to explain values and prices in terms of broad and abstract classes of goods. In other words, they talked about um, water, diamonds, milk, coal, um, in the abstract. They said, well, diamonds are not in, as important as water because without water, human beings could not Exit, could not last very long, more than two or three days without water. Whereas with, what are diamonds? I mean, if diamonds would disappear from the earth, there'd be a little bit less ornamentation that human beings decorated themselves with. Um, but we know that the flaw here is that when human beings ch um, are deciding on different goods, they don't choose all the water in the world or all the, the, the coal in the world. They're choosing between tons of coal or gallons of water or carrots of diamonds they're choosing between concrete units of different things. We all know this from our daily experience. Um, now, if, you, if you're looking on goods as abstract classes of things, what's gonna happen, of course, is that you're gonna come to a paradox. We call this the paradox of value, which um, was actually resolved by one of the classical economists, but then that uh, Adam Smith went, um, fell back into error, okay? So what, what's the paradox of value? 
okay? The paradox of value is the insight or the supposed insight that certain things that have a very high price on the market have a very high exchange value, um, like diamonds, have a very low use value. That is, they don't contribute much to people's welfare overall, okay? Whereas other things like water or bread, and, and they use bread, as a, which is a staple of human life, especially in the 19th century. Um, without bread, you'd starve to death. Bread has a very low exchange value when you compare it to uh, one pound of bread, for example, to a, a carrot of diamonds. But um, it has a very high, has a very high use value, very low exchange value. Um, so for example, you, you take a diamond that's, that, you know, sold for $46 million, uh, the uh, um, into fancy intense pink diamond a number of years ago sold in 2010 sold for this amount of money. Um, so you see that's the exchange value. But again, the classical economists insisted the use value wasn't very important for diamonds. So they had to come up with a solution. What determined value and what determined prices based on, on values? And their solution was erroneous. It was wrong. It was flawed. It was stupid, actually. Um, they weren't stupid, but, but they, they, were, they sort of thought themselves into a corner intellectually. Um, they said, look, all goods have use value, so we're not going to worry about use value. Before something can be exchanged, of course it has use value. So they, they pushed it aside. So use value is not important. What economics is interested in explaining is exchange value. That is the price on the market. Therefore, they said, diamonds are much more expensive than water, despite the difference in, in use values, because diamonds cost more to produce than water does. Okay? So they came up with, they resolved, or they thought they resolved this paradox of value. Well, they didn't resolve it. They, they sort of papered it over uh, by um, developing what's called the um, cost of production theory of value, that the price of a good depends on its cost of production. Now, once you adopt a cost of production theory of value and you cast aside use value, what happens to the consumer and, and, and his and her wants? That goes out the window. You no longer are focusing on the consumer and the values that they place on things, okay? You're focusing on whom? The businessman or the entrepreneur, the business decision maker. Um, the business decision maker pays costs and then produces a product and then sells it on the market for prices. So prices are determined by the cost of production of the business decision maker. Also, you take human beings' wants out of the equation, okay? And instead, instead of, of, of looking on economics as Menger did, Menger was later to do, as the um, striving of human beings to satisfy their wants, their most important wants, you now begin looking on economics as businessmen seeking wealth, selling in, in, the, in the highest market, market with the highest price, and buying where prices are lowest. So it's a pure calculational theory of economics. Now, there's nothing wrong with focusing on, on the calculational aspects of economics. That is, profits and losses, costs and revenues, deciding where to invest resources. But you have to go beyond that, as Menger saw. Where, why would businessmen do this? They would do it because, as Menger traced back, to, to, to human wants, okay? They, they would, they, they, the focus is on, on the consumers in Austrian economics and not, and only um, uh, after you talk about the consumers do you get to the business decision maker and, 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 and his calculations and expectations. Okay, so Menger was very, very interested in um, developing a realistic price theory. He had been a journalist before he was an economist, before he wrote his great book. And what he learned as a journalist was watching the markets was that prices change at every second. Commodities prices, stock prices, despite what their cost of production is. That is, that their cost of production didn't matter to what prices developed on the market. He saw this in, 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 in observing the markets on a daily basis. So prices weren't stuck to their cost of production. They were continuously fluctuating. 
So something else had to, had to explain the determination of prices, right? So right at the, in, in, in his book, um, what he's interested in doing is, is, is forming a theory of price that is based on reality, on observed reality. Um, and you can read that um, quote there. Uh, he was also interested in unifying economics and not saying that use value is, is, is we're not going to talk about use value, we're only going to talk about exchange value. He wanted to explain exchange value based on use value, the value that human beings placed on goods that they, they, would, they would use. So he started a tradition which is called the causal realist tradition, which, which focused on the cause of value and focused on the realistic causes of value. So, so he, would, he would define economics as the investigation of the causes of prices, wages, in, rents, and interests that are actually paid on real markets. And all of these things have the same cause, as we'll see. So for Menger, what is, what is economics all about? Well, he wrote a notebook, kept a notebook before he wrote his book, in 18, and, which was published in 1871. And he wrote notes from 1867 when he was a journalist to when he, he published his book. And he wrote, quote, man is the beginning and the end of every economy. Man is the reason for all economic activity and man is the end in which all economic activity comes, is consummated, that is satisfying human wants. Human wants stimulate people to produce, but the, the, knowing that the production of these goods will cause the satisfaction of their wants. So wants cause production, which in turn causes the satisfaction of the wants. Um, he says, our science is the theory of a human being's ability to deal with his wants. Okay? Just another way of saying the same thing. And he was also very interested in causality. Okay, what the essential relationships of cause and effect in economics. So he said, all things are subject to the law of cause and effect. That's the very first sentence of, of his book, um, The Principles, the very first sentence. Okay, so he also wrote a, tri a triad, three different connections in economics in, in these notes. He says, ends, human ends, things that people want to do, their goals, are what causes them to look around for means, the elements of their environment, which will then allow them to achieve those goals, to realize those goals. So notice that the, the, the causality, it goes from human ends to searching for means and producing goods and services to consuming those goods and services, which realizes the goals, okay? So the ends are then achieved. Um, he also wrote man, these are just notes he was making, man, external world, subsistence, and most importantly, wants, goods, and satisfaction. Wants stimulate the um, production, the activity that, in which goods are produced, um, which then, when they're consumed, satisfy the wants that originally started everything. So to show you this graphically, there's a guy who's hungry, right? Um, he has ideas about how he can satisfy his hunger, but he has to put those ideas into action by having the means, and the means are the ham, the mustard, he's making a ham sandwich, bread, and so on, okay? So it goes from the subjective value of people, the subjective world in which they have goals and they want to achieve these goals, through the objective world, we can't leave out the, the objective um, environment around us um, in which the means exist, they are combined, production is combining the means in a way that Give, improves their value. So alone, ham, uh, mustard, and so on, various means of making a ham sandwich, are not as valuable as when they're combined into a final good, which is a ham sandwich. At which point, when that sandwich is consumed, it satisfies the, that person's hunger, okay? So the hunger, the want for sustenance, was what um, started the whole process of want satisfaction. So once Menger came up with, with, with this main idea, he developed very early in his book what, what, what we call a theory of goods, okay? And this is what, um, th these are his uh, attributes of, a, a, of a, a good. 
There has to be a human need to start. Um, the thing then that uh, the thing that is going is called the good has to be um, brought into causal connection. It has to cause the satisfaction of the need. Okay. Um, human knowledge. People have to know that the ham sandwich will satisfy their hunger. That's not poisonous or something else. They have to have technical knowledge. And they have to have command of the thing. That is, they have to own the thing in the sense that they can manipulate it to, to make it more valuable by, by producing the final consumer's goods. So example, for example, you may know that a sunny day is um, a prerequisite for having a really good picnic um, or going to a baseball game, okay? But the sunny day or the sun is not a good because you don't own it, you don't control it, okay? Only things you can control uh, can, can be goods. Now, Mises, who was obviously a follower of, of Carl Menger, um, pointed out that there's a mistake here. And the mistake is that a, a, a thing is capable of, uh, that, um, that the thing really does have to be capable of causing the satisfaction of a need. I mean, people spend money to, to read the New York Times every day. Um, people go to psychics to, so they can talk to their, their dead relatives, okay? Now, Menger understood this, and, and later on in the book he says, well, there are imaginary needs. No, there's not. A psychic services are good. The New York Times, sorry to say, is a good. Um, so, and it's good because, P so Mises substituted the belief that a thing has the capacity to cause the satisfaction of a human need. That's all there that has to exist. It doesn't really have to cause the satisfaction of, of, of the human need. So, let's talk about Menger and economizing. The classical school used to be accused of talking about a fictitious economic man someone whose only motive was to achieve more wealth. That is the businessman. And it was called homo economicus, the Latin term for economic man. Menger substituted an economizing man, and I'm using man in a generic sense here, um, meaning that when you have some resources and when you have various ends which are of more or less importance to you, what you, what, what you have to do is to decide which is the most important because your, re, your resources are limited, your wants and needs are, as far as we can tell, unlimited. So you have to choose the most important goals or ends to um, satisfy. So that's where economizing comes in, all right? You have to choose between the various um, ends that you can achieve because you have limited wants, uh, limited uh, means. And um, so therefore you have to rank your wants. What is more important, okay? All these wants will make me feel better, will improve my welfare, but some of them are more important than others and I don't have enough resources to satisfy all of those wants. Um, so therefore you have to economize your goods. You have to use your goods for only those wants that are, are, are the most important, the most urgent. So that's where the economizing person or man come, comes in. Now, Menger went on from this point of view to solving the paradox of value. He realized that he, in order, in order to get on with his economics, to, to go beyond um, trying to figure out what, what determines value, he, he, needed, he needed to so resolve what, what the classical school could not do or what they actually created as a problem. So it came up with the law of margin utility, okay? And as I said, it's very different than, than the law of margin utility as it was stated by the other marginalist revolutionaries, Menger, uh, Valras, and Jevons. So let me just state the law. The value of a good is determined by its margin utility. That is, the satisfaction of the least important or lowest ranked end served by the available supply of the good. That's how Menger defined it. Um, Therefore, he, he pointed out that as the supply of a good that you own, as the number of automobiles that you own, as, as, as the amount of um, pizza that you have or, 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 or any other good, as that increases, the value of each car, let's say, declines. So even though they're identical units, 
the values will fall as you add more units of a good. Um, now, how did Menger, well, let, let's, let's give you an example. He used an example, a, a Robinson Crusoe example. He said Robinson Crusoe had, has a limited number of sacks of wheat. He's alone on an island, right? He's the fictitious castaway. He's alone on this island, and he has limited, very limited resources to achieve his goals. And so let's say he harvests some wheat. Um, the most important want for the wheat is to sustain his life, okay? Just to keep him alive for the next year until the next harvest of wheat. Um, set, the second is to, to keep him, um, let him be viable. That is, uh, let him sustain his health so that he, he can be, have vitality and, and he can achieve other ends. The third most important want for a, a sack of wheat is to live another year, which is that by planting the wheat as seed for the following harvest. And then he wants to vary his diet, so the fourth most important want might be for goats, which what, there are wild goats on the island. He can domesticate them and get milk, cheese, and meat, so have a varied a vary diet. Um, Menger used whiskey, but he also wants some kind of a beverage. To, he wants to forget about being ca a castaway and being lonely. Um, so he um, pr pr uses it to produce, let's say, vodka. And um, if he had, now let's assume he only has five sacks of wheat. If he had a sixth sack, which he does not have, I mean, he, there are many other wants, he would feed a parrot. He's lonely. He, he wants company. So he wants someone to talk to or something to talk to, and so on. Um, all right, so that's a fanciful, fanciful example. But now, what is the value of each sack of wheat, Menger asked. Now remember, he's, unlike the classical economists, dealing with units of the good, units of wheat. He's not dealing with it as a class or an abstract class of, of, of goods. So how, how would you determine the value of the wheat? Is a sack of wheat equal to the most important one? Is it equal to an average of all the wants? Well, Menger came up with a very interesting and uh, very momentous question to answer his question. And the question was this. If, for some reason, um, a fox broke into where he was storing the wheat, the five sacks of wheat, and consumed, let's say, the third sack of wheat, would he go without the seed for the next harvest? Would he use the other four sacks for the first, second, fourth, and fifth ends? No, of course not. He would reallocate the wheat to the third end, but what sack would he, would he use? He would use the one that he was originally, initially going to use for um, making vodka, because that's the lowest valued end that the wheat serves. Um, so no matter which one he loses, he loses the, 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 the supply or, or the unit of the supply that would satisfy the lowest valued want, okay? That then, that lowest valued satisfaction of the supply is what we call the marginal utility. Utility simply means satisfaction. Marginal means the unit that you would, would um, is on the margin that you would do without, the, uh, which satisfies the, the lowest valued end. Um, and if he found another sack of wheat somewhere, what would happen to the value of wheat? It would fall, so, so each wheat, each um, sack of wheat is valued by the satisfaction that he would get from, from, from consuming vodka over the next year. But if he's gotten a sixth sack of wheat, what would happen to the value? It would fall to the value of the sixth end, that is feeding a parrot, which he values lower. So the more units of a good you have, the lower the value. So one example I, I give my undergraduates um, is, let's take the example of a family that has three cars. The cars are interchangeable, like these um, sacks of wheat. Um, one is used by the main breadwinner, one is used by um, let's say the mother to run errands. She has a part time or and take and have a part time job. And the third is used by Junior just to drive around with his friends. Okay. Let's say let's say the old man crashes his car on the way to work. Who does without the car? The, the Junior does without the car, right? That's the lowest valued end for that household, which is the satisfaction Junior gets from driving around with with, with his friends. Um, so. 
And at the same time, what happens to the value of the cars to that family? They go up. They go up from the satisfaction from the third end, the satisfaction for the second end. So the less you have of a good, the more valuable it is. So let me just, uh, let's just look at a short quiz here. Um, so this is a farmer. He has three horses, two, two cows. Um, and that's his value scale. That's how he ranks the ends that he can achieve from uh, owning those horses and cows. So the first end and the second end are fulfilled by, um, or, or are satisfied by uh, having the horses. That is plowing so that he can sow wheat. And the second horse makes it easier to plow and, and increases his productivity in, in, in producing wheat. Um, the third end is to um, consume milk that is given by the first cow. Uh, the fourth end is to use the second head of cattle um, for, be for beef. Um, and then the fifth is a horse uh, for recreational riding. So let's ask Menger's question. If all five animals are in the barn and the barn catches fire, and by hypothesis he can only save four of the five, he's going to save the, the, he's, he's going to save the animals, all of the animals that are most valuable, and leave one of the animals that's least valuable. So which, which animal... Looking at that, has, has greater value? The horse or the cow? The cow has greater value because it has a higher what? Margin utility. The margin utility of the cow is the fourth end. The margin utility of the horse is the fifth end. Now, if the horse perishes in a fire, which animal has more value? The horse. The horse has more value, okay? Because its margin utility is now the second end. It's so more important. If he were to lose another horse, he would lose more satisfaction than if he were to lose another cow. Okay, now we can resolve the paradox of value, and Menger did. So the paradox of value says that, you know, how could diamonds be more expensive on the market when they have a lower use value than bread, okay, or water? Okay, well, now we know. If, you're, if, if someone's in a desert and, and they haven't had water for three days, but they have that that fancy pink diamond that costs $46 million in their pocket. And someone else, and this is the third day without water, and they're, about, they're on the point of, of, of um, dying of thirst, would they trade the diamond for the gallon of water? Sure. And the reason is, water is so much more scarce in that abnormal situation that it has a higher margin utility than a $46 million diamond. So, which, so that resolves the paradox of value, okay? The, the, the value of a good, the subjective value of a good, depends on how many units you have of it. In a normal situation, you have more than enough water. Water fills so many more ends that its margin utility is very low compared to diamonds. That's why, in a normal situation, diamonds cost a lot more than water. So we, ex we explain price by deriving it from people's judgments of value and the number of units of goods that they possess. Okay, what's the value of air in this room? Now, we know we couldn't live more than a few minutes without air. The value of air in this room is zero. There is no value of air in this room. Because if you think in terms of concrete units and specific wants, if you lose one cubic foot of air out of this room, no human wants go unserved because you, th that air has escaped from this room. Now, if you happen to be a, a deep sea diver or if you happen to be on the moon, what happens to the value of air? It shoots up, okay? Because the number of units of air have, have changed in, in relation to wants. So Menger goes beyond this. As I said, he's very interested in causality. And he says, you know, it takes time to produce goods to satisfy our wants. And goods go through a process in which they are transformed. And, and, and by the way, the definition of production is not the creation of value. It's the, transfer, it's the transformation of goods into more, from less to more valuable goods. Um, a long time, in 1802, um, a great French economist, J.B. Say, pointed out that produ pr production 
is not creation but transformation. Only God could create, say said, um, but, but man can transform elements of his environment into elements that are more useful to him. So in other words, he can transform land and labor into consumer goods. So Menger pointed out that there were higher orders and lower orders of goods. Higher orders of goods are further away from, consumption, from consumers in time. Okay, so if you have, um, you're producing, let's say, um, automobiles, you can see that iron ore is, is, is one of the highest order goods that goes into producing an automobile, which is then transformed into steel, and steel production plus labor causes the production of another of finished steel, refined steel, which in turn, when you combine it with more labor, is transformed into an automobile body stamping, the parts for the car. And then the next stage, you, you take these higher order goods and you transfer them into even lower order goods, goods closer to consumers until you get to, to the consumer's good. Um, so notice that goods go from product, from our, that, that in production, higher order goods cause the production of lower order goods, all right? But things are going to be different when we talk about value of higher order goods. Because Menger wanted to explain the value of all goods, not just consumer goods. Um, and Menger stated the law of imputation, which was the law of the value of, of, of higher order goods. He said, the value of means is determined by the value of the ends or wants they serve. Okay. Value is imputed back, backwards from consumer value judgments. So it's really not even the automobile that has value. What has value is when you're driving that automobile, the service the automobile gives you in transportation, in prestige, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a very nice automobile, that it's the services that have the initial value because they're what directly satisfies the wants. Then that is imputed backwards to the value of the car. The car is a value based on all the future services that that car will yield to you in your, in your um, estimation, okay? So production goes from top to bottom, from the higher order goods to the lower order goods. But value goes from the lower order goods, from the consumer uh, consumption experience, backwards or upwards towards the higher order goods. And Menger pointed out, well, let me just show you this and then I'll mention what he pointed out. Um, so notice the blue arrow going down. That's the direction of production. But the red arrow going upwards is the direction of what? Value, okay? Bread has a value because consumers value cons the services of consuming bread. Um, bread at wholesale has a value because the retailer values the bread because that will cause him to get a price for selling the bread, and so on. Flour only has a, a, a value because bread has a value, and wheat only has a value because flour has a value. So. Cost of production theory is completely wrong, Menger pointed out, okay? A good isn't valuable, a, a diamond or anything that's produced, an automobile is not valuable because it costs a lot to produce, it's the other way around. Because something has such a high value, people will spend a lot of costs, a lot of resources and time trying to produce that thing, okay? Because it is valued, valuable to begin with, and that's the law of imputation. Um, so Menger used the following example. He said, what would happen if people suddenly realized that tobacco was not good for them? Um, what would happen to the value of cigarettes, cigars, pipe, tobacco, and so on? If everyone felt this way, it would go to zero. But then what would happen to the value of, of, of cigarette rolling machines, um, workers' wages that, that were participated in, in, in producing c cigarettes and, and tobacco problem, uh, products. What would happen to, to the value of um, tobacco leaves and, and the land on which tobacco is produced? All would go to zero, okay? And they would go to zero because the value of tobacco has gone to zero. So I watched for about the 10th time uh, a movie, um, Witness, with Harrison Ford takes place in uh, Amish country, in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania. Um, and the Amish are called the plain people because they don't wear any fancy clothing, according to their religion. Um, 
they don't even have buttons on their clothing because that, they think that that's ostentatious and, and, and vain to have buttons. So obviously Amish people don't value diamonds at all. What if all Americans took on that sort of code of ethics and, and thought that any, any so, sort of personal ornamentation it was vain and, and wrong? Um, well, we know what would happen, right? The price of diamonds would fall to zero, so forgetting about their industrial uses. And then the very high wages of people who appraise diamonds, what they're worth, that would fall to zero. And so would the value of diamond mines fall to zero. Okay, so that's the law of imputation. That's how Menger explained the value of um, higher order goods. All right, um, Menger went on to talk a little bit about exchange. Um, and margin utility. He didn't go much beyond, he didn't actually develop a theory of price. That was uh, later on. Uh, he got involved in, in debates with uh, a German school of economics and um, unfortunately did not go on to complete his theory of economics. Um, that was done later by Bombaverk, another uh, Austrian economist who was Mises' teacher, and Ludwig von Mises and, and Murray Rothbard. Um, but in this, so for, for Menger, um, exchange this is another myth that he, uh, uh, of the classical economists that he destroyed, that exchange took place between two goods that were equal in value. That if you pay $70,000 for a BMW, for example, for, which they're now more than that, um, that it, the BMW had a value equal to the uh, $70,000, okay? And that if you paid more than that, you were being cheated. Or if you paid less than that, somehow you were lowballing the guy. Um, because it's really worth what the price is on the market. But as we saw, price is determined by subjective values in any case. So Menger extended this to exchange. What he pointed out is that the two goods exchanged are not equal in value. They're doubly unequal in value. There's a double inequality of value. So the, to, the, to, the, to the buyer of the car, the car has a higher value than $70,000. He could spend that $70,000 on many things, but of all the things that, that would give him satisfaction, the automobile at that point in time has, would give him the highest satisfaction. So he values that automobile more than he does the $70,000. So there's an inequality of value there, but the seller also prefers the $70,000 to the automobile. And there's an inequality of value there, and they're opposite, so whenever you have um, opposite inequalities of value, there will be an exchange. Whenever one person values something more highly than something else, and that is a reverse of what the other person values it, that, that's when exchange takes place. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here. And um, so these are basically the, the, the various themes that you will be hearing this, this week, okay? But, but they, remember, they all stem from Karl Menger, okay? They're all derived from his genius work, which I recommend you read. It's, 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 very, it's a fairly simple book to read. It's called Principles of Economics, and it's fairly short. Thank you.